Good morning, guys. Thank you, bud. Good to see you this morning. Good to see you. Listen, I want to explain this word to you today, and I'm going to tie it in with this. Anybody knows what this is? American flag. American flag. What does it stand for? Our country, right? And so when we pledge allegiance to the flag, does anybody know what we're doing? I know. Listen, we used to know what we were doing because we had to do this. I'll tell you what. I want you to see the number of old people out here that when we went to school, this is something that we did every day and we knew why we were doing it. Anybody out here that knew this was a part of you going to school every day, you stood up and you pledged allegiance to the flag out here. Take the easy way and raise your hand or you can stand up. I see you raise your hand up out there, right? Look at the people. Can you believe that? Now I want you to see what's in common with all those people. They're over a certain age. You know that? Right? All right, so you may be seated, guys. They're over a certain age because anymore, listen, sometimes we don't think this is important, but it's not just to be able to praise the people because we've got people now that, that basically are making laws and and they don't think about God. You say, well, hey, how can I, if I'm somebody that's a Christian, how can I be happy that you've got people up there that are, that are not godly people? Well, the thing that you're happy about that you're praising God for is that he did something for us that he didn't have to do. He did something for us that he didn't have to do. Do you realize there's other places to where the people don't have a choice of, of coming in here and, and worshiping? They don't have a choice of knowing that they treat each other the way that they need to be treated. They're ran in, in countries to where I'll bet there's people in other countries. And I met some people last year. Do you realize their moms and dads, they work a whole month and they don't make as much as your mom and dad's making a day, a whole month because well, nothing's really right and wrong there. It's all set up by somebody that that's selfish. So what God does is he allows us something just like where we live He allows it to happen. Now, how how many people here deserve to have everything that you've got? Anybody here deserve everything that you've got? No? You don't deserve it? Right? Why don't you deserve it? Have you done something wrong? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to ask you specifically what it is, right? But you've done something wrong before, Jack? Have you? Anybody else done something wrong? Yeah. Yeah. Have you done something wrong to your parents? Anybody here? Yep, yep. Raise your hand if you have. I'm going to give you a chance to be honest if you have. All right, now that everybody's raised them, you can raise yours. All right, there you go. All right, so you've done something wrong to your parents, right? So how many of you have went back to your parents and asked them for something lately? Everybody. What do you ask, what do you ask them for? The shoes. Shoes? What else? Somebody tell me. What else? Toys. Toys. What else? What do you ask them for? To go somewhere, do something? What do you ask them for? Yep, to, to, to do something that you want to do. You just want to do something. Now, why should they let you do that? Why should they let you do anything? Well, they love you, but you don't deserve for them to let you do it, right? Yeah, yeah. If you think about it, we don't really deserve it. But the point that they let you do something and they love you even though you don't deserve it, you know what that's called? Grace. Say it with me. Grace. That's when somebody does something for you that you don't deserve right now every time you come up here and i give you a pack of these gummies let me ask you something what what did y'all do this week did anybody here do something for me this week what'd you do what'd you do you did that for me no what'd you do for me this week yeah did you do anything for me Anybody? No. But I still love you, right? You don't have to do something for me. I I love you, right? And so I'm going to give you these. You know what this is? This is a gift of what? Grace. Say it with me. What is it? I'm going to give you something even though you really didn't do anything to get it. It's a gift of grace. I'm saying that because we have to understand something here. Listen, God is the biggest giver of grace. God gives us things that we don't deserve. Now, how many people here have been old enough to accept the Lord as their Savior? Anybody here? All right. So, let me ask you, Olivia. You got saved. You accepted the Lord as your Savior. What did you ever do that was good enough where God should have saved you? Anything? 
No, but you've done wrong things, but he saved you anyway. So God is the biggest giver of grace, and it's everywhere in our life. He gives us grace. Grace is what he gives us that we don't deserve. So what's our word for today? Grace. Now, he doesn't just give it. He expects you to be able to give grace to other people, all right? So just the fact that we're celebrating this week that God gave us grace and lets us live in a place where we can freely serve him, where we have what food to eat, we have all these different things where you can enjoy it. When's the last time you really thanked God for the grace that he gives us? It has to do with where we live, what we eat, what you play with. There's a lot of people that don't have what you have, and it's not that you deserve it. God gives it to you because it's grace, all right? So let's pray. Lord, I love you, I praise you, and I thank you for all that you do. I pray, God, that you would just continue to teach these children and impress upon the ones that bring them here, Lord, to make them be able to be in your presence and hear your word so they can grow closer to you. I pray for those here that haven't accepted your son Jesus as Savior yet. I pray, God, for their souls. I pray, God, that through your grace, they would all come to salvation knowledge and walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Here you go. You're welcome. You're welcome. You. You're welcome. You. You're welcome. You. You're welcome. How many people have your Bible this morning? If you have your Bible, stand up and raise it above your head. Bear witness of God's word. Beautiful. Look around. Is that beautiful or what? Amen. You may be seated. I have one request this morning before we start, just in honor of God and his presence in this room. If you have a cell phone, I would ask you to turn it off or silence it, but by all means, do not use it for anything except to look up scripture. It's, it's alarming to say that there was somebody uh, a couple people that last week were talking about they couldn't focus because someone was playing a game on the phone beside of them or somebody was doing this. So I, I ask you just to be able to, to, in reverence to God, use your phones if you got your Bible on there, but by all means, uh, have reverence to God and know that this is a time where he can speak to you, but he's not going to stand in line behind somebody else that you want to talk to, okay? So with that being said, I see Miss Sherry standing up. Go ahead, Miss Sherry. Amen. 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 Wonderful. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. 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 Right. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sister. God bless you. Thank you, sister. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bible this morning, turn to the book of John, chapter 1. After you find that, please turn to the book of Ruth, chapter 1. You might say, how did John and Ruth go together? I would have never guessed it until God led me in this way. But this week, I feel like, I've been so excited to come in here and share with you. I feel like that, you know, when you see that little 
that little jewel in the Bible that links things together. And then you look back on your life and it's one of those aha moments that says, this is why. Well, I was able to see one of those this is why this week. And we're going to talk about grace today. But there were some things that I don't think that we understand about grace. What's one of the most popular songs that we come to church and sing? Somebody tell me all at one time. Amazing Grace. Amazing grace. And whose grace are we talking about? God. We're talking about God's grace. Grace, grace, God's grace. A lot of songs talk about God's grace, and that's one of the things we praise Him for. He has grace. He loves us, even though we don't deserve it. He loves us, and as Sister Sherry would say, He continues to make Himself available. He talks to us. He, he does things for us. He heals us. He gives us company. He gives us companionship. He's always working our life. And then at the end, if that's not enough, He gives us eternal life in heaven, and none of us deserve it. If I have a list here of the things that I've done for God, and I weigh it against the book of the things that I, I did against God, it would clearly be visible that I don't deserve what he's done. So as we talk about grace, we'll realize God's grace is great. But then we get to a point to where, in grace, we sort of get a little backwards. Even as Christians, we have in our mind that Grace is something that only God gives. God's great at giving grace, so we praise God for His grace. We don't think about the grace that we're willing to give. And then sometimes we even take the grace that God's given us, and we, listen to this word, we sort of blaspheme that grace. You wouldn't believe in the position that I'm in of hearing people. You, you see that people begin to expect grace. When you expect grace, it isn't grace anymore. Now get this. If you get the mindset that God owes you something, then it goes out of the grace category anymore. You wouldn't believe the people that you minister to and they get in a situation, and I was one of those same people, so I'm not pointing a finger. I'm one of those people that there's a certain period during my Christian life where things happen, and I began to ask the question, God, why? Why me? I'm not as bad as these other people. I'm not doing this. Why? Why me? Why am I going through this? Why does this happen? Why does this happen? Why does this happen? As if I was saying, you owe me more than this. Is that just me? And boy, you'll get a little sideways when you get like that. Much less the pity party. You begin to get discouraged and despondent. But that's not the only place it is. The graces, or the absence of grace, it's a huge problem. It's a problem in marriages. It's a problem in the local church. It's a problem in your relationships. I want you to see today this issue with grace and why we don't. You see, God is willing, and understand this, God is willing to pour His grace upon you. But, Something depends on us in order to see this continual pouring. That question is answered in the Bible. I want you to see it. It's beautiful. In John chapter 1 today, we go back to where John was explaining to us the essence of Jesus, if you will. What it is about Jesus and how he came to be and why he's so important. And John took this first chapter. And he said, hey, I need to explain to you that Jesus is God in the flesh. God the Father that created the heavens and the earth. God, knowing that he sits on his throne, he knows we can't really comprehend him. We say we praise God, but who knows what God looks like? Anybody? How many people have heard that voice split a ceiling and you've actually heard this audible voice give you? No, we don't know that. So it takes faith to believe that. So God said, listen, I've made provision for you. I want to give you a glimpse of what I am in the flesh. So God in the flesh came to this earth and his name was what? Jesus Christ. The Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life 
And that life was the light of man. And that light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. That means that light, when it shines, nothing can cover it up. But it's interesting, if you look at that first verse of John 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word. And if you've got the right kind of Bible, Word needs to be capitalized there. It's capitalized because it's a proper name. He's saying, I gave Jesus this name of the Word. So why do we say that? Well, we say it for this reason. Well, let me just see. Anthony, if I were to tell you today that that is a nice-looking shirt that you have on, the glasses look so well on you and they make you distinguished, and also, by the way, Anthony, besides all that, I appreciate who you are. I appreciate your willingness to serve this church, and I appreciate the sacrifice that you make. I appreciate the example you set for your family, right? I just communicated all these things to Anthony using what? Tell me again. You understand what I've told you. Now, try it this way. Do you know what I said? You have no idea, right? Because I used what? I used the means of communication. I used the word and another word. And God is trying to tell us Jesus is his way of communicating himself to us. He's the word. His word became flesh and dwelt among us. We read later on in this passage. If you're reading John here with me or you've turned there, it says in verse 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Now hold on a second. Full of what? Grace and truth. Now it doesn't stop there. This is big. He goes on to say, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spoke. He that cometh after me was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me. This is John the Baptist, for he was before me. John's saying, Jesus has always been. You're just seeing him now. And then he says, And of his fullness have we all received. Listen, and grace for grace. Let me read it again. And of his fullness have have all we received. And what? Tell me again. One more time. And what in the world is he talking about? But he's on it because the next verse he explains. He says, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now we need to understand something at the beginning of this. The law of Moses is the Old Testament law. You say, y'all, yeah, that's no good anymore. Hey, that's God's mind. Don't call it no good anymore. God put that out there for us to know what to do and what not to do before Jesus got here. It was in in knowing that God was going to send Jesus, but the way that God gave man to be able to come to him was through this Old Testament law. So God said, these are the obedient commands I give to you. You have a choice to obey these, right? So man knew that he could come to God by obedience. He could bring a sacrifice and have his sins forgiven. And he says that law came through Moses. Remember, Moses went up and God revealed it and he brought them to the people. But he said the law was given by Moses, but, listen, grace and truth through Jesus Christ. Meaning what? See, when Jesus came, Jesus did something that the law couldn't do. The law couldn't give you salvation. All the law could do is tell you why you didn't deserve it. Does anybody know that there was only one person that could ever live a life completely obeying the Old Testament law? And that was Jesus. So the law didn't give us salvation. It actually condemned us. It let us see, hey, we messed up. Hey, we messed up. Hey, we messed up. But Jesus came, and we were able to receive this new thing called grace through Jesus. What does that mean? That means that Jesus saw that we could not get to God by complete obedience to the law. So what did he do? He became the sacrifice, the only one that could obey the law. He laid down his life to say, I will sacrifice my life so that my blood will forgive your sins because you can't obey the law. So did Jesus have to do it? Somebody tell me. No. Do we deserve for him to do it? 
No. So his ministry was a ministry of grace. And did God have to let Jesus do it? No. So Jesus came with truth. This is the only truth. The truth is that the only way you can get to God is through receiving his gift of grace. Webster says, grace, and listen, pretty good definition, unconstrained and undeserved divine favor or goodwill. Listen to this. God's loving mercy displayed to man for the salvation of his soul. It was in an older edition of Webster. But grace is not just something that only God can give. Here's what we need to see. We are given an opportunity to give grace. Grace can be described as an unearned kindness, but it's more than an attitude of favor or mercy. Grace, in simply put terms, grace is doing what we don't have to do. Did you get that? Grace is doing what we don't have to do. Now, yes, we struggle with it. How many people enjoy doing something that you don't have to do? Anybody? In our nature, we don't want to do something that we don't have to do. Grace is when you extend something in an unselfish way. You do something you don't have to do. So when we talk about the grace of God, did God have to save us? No. Did Jesus have to die for us? Did God have to do anything for us to get us to him? After you've been saved, does he have to keep forgiving you? Does he have to give you second chances, third chances, hundreds? No, it's grace, it's grace. So God's doing something he doesn't have to do, but he's doing it through love. And so we can sit here all day long and say, God in his infinite grace. But at some point in time, we need to turn the camera around and look to us and say, if we're a child of God, if we're a product of God, and he's shown grace to us, what does he want us to show? Now, here's the key. This is the little jewel that I happen to stumble over. Do you realize there are so many people that are in this world that are saying, and Christians, why me? Why does it have to happen to me? This grace that I think I deserve. Do you know that I looked back in my life on a period of time when I was that person who was wondering, well, God, why did this happen? And I'm upset today, and this is, I'm disappointed about this, and I'm disappointed this. I lived in this state of, of mind of where always it seemed like my expectations weren't met. Like, this is what should be happening in my life. But something that was a correlation during that time was that during that time, I was not someone who would show grace to anybody else, but I expected grace. Pull them on up, right? (laughs) Why? Because we act as if grace is just something that God has to give. But when we're unwilling to to forgive somebody, when we hold something against somebody for who they are, where they're born, what they've done, we're not really showing grace. As if they have to deserve something to us. You say, well, this person's wronged me, so I have nothing to do with them anymore. Right. And we're the same people that ask God for grace, but we're not willing to give grace. So I take you to a story in the book of Ruth, and I think this was so clear. I want to give you some background. Turn to Ruth chapter 1. In Ruth chapter 1, The word grace appears in the Bible for the second time. At the beginning, the first time was back in Genesis. Back in Genesis, there was a man named Noah. First time grace appears on the words of the scripture. Genesis 6, 8 says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace. What does that mean in the eyes of the Lord? Where are you going to see this story? Ruth found grace. Now, let me give you some background on Ruth. There was a man in the Old Testament named Elimelech. He had a wife named Naomi. You'll read that if you read the beginning of the book of Ruth. Naomi and Elimelech had two sons. One's name was Malin, one's name was Chilin. They both married these two young ladies. But they didn't marry them until they left their native country. They were in Bethlehem, but... They left because there was like a famine there, so they went over to a Moabite country. 
which is a country that didn't worship God, and their sons ended up marrying women that were not God worshipers. One's name was Orpha and one's name was Ruth. Well, listen, the worst thing in the world happened. You would think, how in the world could this bad thing happen? First of all, Elimelech died. So the patriarch of the family passed away. Naomi was upset. Then guess what happened? Both of her sons died. So there you had Naomi. She had lost a husband and two sons. You had Orpha. She lost her husband. Ruth lost her husband. Just these three women here. Do you believe there was a time when they sat there and said, hey, why? Because Naomi, she was a God worshiper. We see that she had even told these girls, hey, this is the God you need to worship. So she was leading them, but Naomi became bitter. And if you read this first chapter, you'll see that Naomi was so bitter, she said, hey, listen, according to the law, the only way that you girls would be required to stay with me is if I had another son that could take you as a wife. And you can see that I'm old. I'm not going to bear any more children. And if I bore a child today, by the time he was old enough, you would be too old. There's hopeless. Girls, what y'all need to do is just leave me. Just go your own way. Let me just sit here and drown in my pity. Go your own way. God has just looked in a bad way upon me. And so the one, Orpha, she said, okay, I'll see you later. And the Bible says she went back to her own gods. But there was this girl named Ruth. And Ruth, Ruth said this in verse 16. Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. Thy God shall be my God. Where thou diest, will I die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me. And more also, if all but, part, but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking to her. So Ruth decided she's going to stay. I'm staying with you. This God that I began to worship, I'm going to keep worshiping him. And wherever you go, I'm going to go. Nothing but death will separate us, Naomi. Now listen, I need to ask you something at this point. Did Ruth have to do this? Couldn't she have went back and worshiped the other gods? Couldn't she have stayed where she was at? But she chose, she didn't have to, to go back to Bethlehem with Naomi. Now, it wasn't that Naomi was some great encourager. Because if you read the rest of chapter 1, Naomi came back and she grabbed the uh, circle number 4, the ladies that met on Thursday evening together. And she said, ladies, come in here. I don't even want you to call me. I don't even want you to call me Naomi. Call me Mara because I'm bitter. I'm bitter. God has done all these things to me. I don't know why. You might as well just don't say anything to me. I'm bitter. At the same time, here you had this little Ruth. She was a hanger on her. And Ruth said, listen, I know you're in this funk. I know that you've got your mind all messed up. I know you're just, her name's Naomi, but we could call her Negative Nellie, Debbie Downer. We could call her whatever we want to call her. She was negative. Ruth said, I'm going to go out and make sure we've got something to eat. So the Bible tells us Ruth went out to start gathering grain. But see, she was a stranger. And being a stranger, you can't go out. She was from Moab. She couldn't go to these fields in Bethlehem and just say, I'm going to start gathering grain. So she went behind those that were harvesting and reaping. And she just gathered what they left in the corner of the field before the birds got it. The scraps. She might have finished the day with a handful to take back to her and Naomi. But she was content. It never says she was unhappy, does it? And if you read chapter 2, verse 3, we see God's orchestrative hand come in. Verse 3 says, And it was her hap to light upon the field. What field? The field that Boaz owned. So now a man named Boaz comes into the picture. Ruth was following behind, content just to take the scraps. She didn't have to even be out there. She could have went back to Naomi and said, this isn't working, they're only giving me a dollar an hour to relate it to our terms. But she didn't. She kept going out, doing something she didn't have to do. Was it for herself? No, she was being unselfish. So with this being said, Boaz noticed Ruth. And when Boaz noticed Ruth, he went to his reapers and he says, who is this woman? Listen to the way that she is described in Ruth chapter 2. I'll read verses 7 through 12. 
one of the other reapers said, this is what she said to us. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now. Did she work a full day? Yes. That she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth. So Boaz takes a step up to Ruth and says, Hearest thou not? That means listen to me, my daughter. Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap. Go, go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art a thirst, go to the vessels and drink that which the young men have drawn. Look what happened to Ruth. You would never expect it. Here a stranger in the land, somebody that didn't have any kind of blink, and Boaz saw something in her. Because God orchestrated, it was her hap. It wasn't fate, it wasn't coincidence, it was God's planning to let Ruth be in Boaz's field. See, God gives opportunities for grace to happen. Remember that. So as Ruth sees the owner of the field come up and Boaz says, Hey, listen, listen to me. I don't want you going to any other field. Now, what could she have been expecting? Here comes the owner. He's going to tell me I can't go behind. Here comes the owner. He's going to tell me I can't do it. And he's got every right. I'm a stranger. I'm a Moabitess. I mean, he doesn't know anything about Naomi. and He doesn't know what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get bread, bread from my, my mother-in-law for us to get this handful of grain. He doesn't know any of that. So, yes, by rights he can. But he did something he didn't have to do. Hey, that's the definition of what? Somebody tell me. So he showed grace on her. He said, hey, Ruth, don't go to another field. You see these ladies? You see these men that are are out here harvesting in my field? You stay with them. I've instructed the young men, don't bother you. Don't lay a hand on you. We find out later he had people on purpose dropping little bits of grain so she could get them. Dropping the little bits of grain. And then he said, when you get thirsty out here, don't you go down away from the people. You go to my water pot and you get something to drink. Did Boaz have to say that? No, he was showing what? Later on in the chapter, you'll read, Boaz actually told her, when you get hungry, there's a place at my table too that you can sit and eat. When Ruth went home with the day, what she had gathered, she presented that. It wasn't some little handful. It was a bunch. And Naomi said, what in the world has happened? This bitter woman. So the testimony of the grace that Boaz showed ended up being a testimony that Naomi was going to see to bring her back to God. Listen, grace is involved throughout this story. Amen? Amen. Now, it gets good because... Ruth asked the question that we want to ask. And we see the answer. Will you go with me to verse 10? This is Ruth. She fell on her face. Was she humble? She couldn't believe what he just told her. And she bowed herself to the ground and she said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes? That thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I'm a stranger. She didn't say, you should have done this. Why didn't you do this? She said, why have I found grace in thine eyes? I want to take you back and tell you something pretty interesting. The Bible describes Noah as a man that found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And Ruth said, why have I found grace in thine eyes? Understand something. There's somebody always, always watching to see if they can give grace. God the Father is looking at you to see if he can do something gracious on your life. But you know what he sees a lot of times? He sees somebody that he wants to give grace to, but he can't. Because the way grace works is it's grace for grace. If we're not willing to show it, we definitely shouldn't expect it. You see, he saw a lady named Ruth that was willing to do something she didn't have to do. God spoke to him and says, hey, do something you don't have to do. It's beautiful. It's called grace for grace. Say it with me. Now listen to his answer. 
Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been shown me all that thou hast done to thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy nativity, and art come into a people which thou knowest not therefore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given to thee of the Lord of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to rest. Something amazing here. He says, I've seen what you're willing to do that you don't have to, but this isn't coming from me. Here's another thing about grace. When somebody gets grace, they don't take credit for it. Boaz said, this is coming by way of the Lord. And if somebody takes credit for the grace they're giving, you've just messed up that whole gift of grace. It's pretty interesting here that as he tells her this, in answer to your question, why have I found grace? You don't have to do this, Mr. Boaz. You don't have to give this to me. I'm a stranger. And he says, I've, I've seen that you've been unselfish. I've seen that you've been willing to sacrifice. I've seen that you've humbled yourself to do some things you don't have to do or wouldn't be expected to do. Th this is the reason that you found grace in my eyes. This is the reason I want to give you my favor. This is the reason I want to give the blessings to you. Listen, this is the message of God, not to Boaz, to Ruth, but from him to us. God wants to give us grace. But have we found grace in his eyes? And I began to think about this. Can you go a little bit deeper with me? Just a little bit deeper. In order to find grace in God's eyes, what do we use eyes to do? In order to find grace in God's eyes, then he has to see that we're willing to show grace. If we're willing to show grace, then we find grace. His grace. It's a beautiful picture. It's so simple and clear. But all this time in my Christian life, I've been quick to stand up and sing Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Thank you, God, for your grace. And I don't think we need to stop praising him for it. But in the same mix, I begin to think about God's grace being so powerful. I don't put any kind of conditions on my life that require me to give grace to anybody. They wronged me. They did this to me. I'm not going down there. I'm not doing this. I don't have anything to do with them. You say, what do you know about that, Pastor? I can say one thing wrong in this church and somebody say, I don't want to go listen to him anymore because he said that, right? What? You turn around and want to pray for grace on your life, but you're not willing to give it to somebody? Let me quote the greatest preacher that ever walked the face of the earth. He who was without sin cast the first stone. You know what he taught that day? A lesson on what? Somebody tell me loudly. Grace. I don't like this, and I don't like this, and they've done this to me, but yet we come back to God and say, God, can you give me this? God, can you give me this? When I look back on my life, I don't know if it looks like yours, but there was a time I didn't have compassion. There was a time that I was just looking to see what had wronged me or who had wronged me, and I see it everywhere today. I see it more today. Listen, this is going to blow your mind. I see it more today in marriages than anywhere. Let me tell you how grace comes to play in the marriage relationship, in the everyday relationship, in the church relationship. First of all, the marriage relationship. In the marriage relationship, I'll have someone that sits in here and I'll ask you, hey, Miss Lady, hey, what is it about this relationship that you want to tell me? All right, first of all, he doesn't do this. He should do that. He used to do this. And now when I do this, he doesn't do this and he should be doing this and I expect him to do this. Okay, Mr. Man, what is it that you want to tell me? Well, listen, I would be doing that if she did this and we've got to a place to where she doesn't do this anymore. And if she did this anymore, I'd want to do this, but she doesn't do this. And by the way, she didn't do this and two weeks ago I mean we've got this list in our minds so I asked them hey by the way can I ask you something what is it that you can do that can help your marriage and it sounds like this <laughs> see we've got this ready list of what we expect you know what we expect we expect grace 
But our list of what we're willing to give is way back in there. Listen, I'll have that young couple come in and I'm counseling on marriage and I'll ask them these questions. Hey, now when he does this, does it bother you? I mean, it does, but I mean, I love him and I look over it and, and you, what about her? I thought you said that she, you know, that she needed to know how to, you know, you wanted her to know how to cook and you expect her to do that. Yeah, but man, I mean, you know, it'll happen. It's going to be that time. I mean, they're so willing to give grace, aren't they? You ever see that in that young dating relationship? So willing to give grace. Oh, it's okay. How many times in that young relationship do you say, it's okay, don't worry about it. Then something happens. And it isn't funny. What happens is you become accustomed to getting grace. Something happens where you're not hearing the voice of the Lord speak and the marriage goes on these years and these years and you quit giving grace all of a sudden the things that they use today that you would say okay now it's something you talk about for days on end and then you begin to dwell on it and there's resentment that grows in what is the problem the problem is the marriage couple has quit giving each other grace it's as clear and simple as that grace is a product of love I didn't expect to be hitting all these things today, but hey, it's there. Guys, do you know how important not God's grace, but the grace we're supposed to show is? In saying that, I have to take you to this point that you got to realize before you can really show grace, you can be nice to somebody, but before you can show grace, you have to receive grace. When the Bible says grace for grace, it's talking, it's talking for, uh, in John 1 about the abundance of grace that God has got. And here's what he tells us. He tells us, basically by the story that we've, we've seen here, that, okay, number one, Ruth didn't have to do what she did. Ruth showed what? And when she did that, Boaz saw what Ruth was doing, so her, her grace was rewarded by an act of what? And Boaz said, it wasn't really me that did it. God led me to do it because he wanted to show you what? So God gave Boaz grace for giving Ruth grace, for giving Naomi grace. Now listen, because it gets better. Because Boaz received a gift for his grace. He ended up marrying her. She became his wife. They had a son named Obed. Obed had a son named Jesse. Jesse had a son named David. Listen. Boaz became David's great-grandfather and part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ himself. Grace for grace for grace for grace. Guess what happens when your part isn't in there? It stops. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, listen, Do you know that if it was up to us, this would never happen? God shows grace first. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God is waiting and he's saying today, I want you to realize I have a gift of grace for you. You don't deserve it. Mike, you're a sinner. Paul, you're a sinner. Kathy, you're a sinner. Pete, you're a sinner. Lana, you're a sinner. I could go down the line. We're all sinners, right? What do I do? What did I do to deserve it? Nothing. So I'm getting something that I don't deserve and God's doing something he doesn't have to do. That's the definition of grace. I can be a child of God today by accepting the gift of grace for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God doesn't pay us For our grace, he rewards us. You say, is that different? Yes, you can't earn grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, nothing you've done you can boast about. It was through grace. But when I receive it, I'm supposed to turn around and give it back out. 
because it's grace for grace. And when I give it back out and God sees that I'm willing to represent him and the grace he gave me by giving grace out and doing something that I don't have to do for somebody else, guess what he says? I'm going to put, give you even more grace on your life. I'm going to put favor on your life. Listen, I've lived in his grace and favor and I've lived out of his grace and favor and I can tell you the only two things that are different was the grace that I was willing to show. But in order to receive God's grace, it requires you to do something that you don't have to do. When I tell you today that God loves you, that he wants your fellowship so bad, he wants you to be a part of him so bad, he wants to give you an eternal home in heaven, but he wants to have fellowship with you now and love on you and bless you and have, have a relationship where you're talking to him. When I tell you that today, you have a choice to accept it or not. If you want to accept it, then you're going to do something that you don't have to do. God recognizes your first step of grace, saying, I'm going to believe something I don't have to. I'm going to step out. When you do that, then it's grace for grace. When you extend that, God says, hey, I've got a pile of it. I'll keep it coming if you keep it coming. Why does it stop? Because it's grace for grace. God's always going to have his grace. It's ours before the four that gets messed up. We defend our position so many times. We think it's what happened to us. We think it's who wronged us. Do you realize you can't even forgive anybody without using grace? You're not going to witness to anybody without using grace. You can't show the love of God without using grace. Listen, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I stand before you today as somebody who's messed up before. God forgave me of that. And if you look at me as a perfect person in here today, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to have to use some grace to come into this body of Christ and, and know because you've got an imperfect pastor that God's put grace on before. But I'm going to look at you the same way. And I'm not going to judge you for what you have done before because God's not judging me for what I have done before. God's exemplifying his love to me through the, the, the word grace He's smiling upon my life and giving me everyday fellowship with him in the midst of any kind of trouble. You could be a Naomi. You could have lost this. You could have lost that. You could have been to the point to where you've cried out to God and said, why? And I would say that what we need to cry out to God and says, why not? Why shouldn't this be happening to me? Remember my list? It should all be happening to me. By the grace of God, I have hope that it can stop and that I can have a relationship with him. But God's always orchestrating. Grace for grace for grace. I can't tell you how many years I didn't take my grace for his grace. Might as well, I hadn't been. We hadn't been on it all day. It's grace for grace. What's our message? Wrote all these things out and I learn them. God just pulls on my heart and tugs on my heart as I'm learning about this stuff and I get up here and I can't even follow it. Why? Because the Lord wants to speak. What's his, what's his message to you? His message to you is he loves you. You think everything else in the world is more important. There's nothing more important than God's love. He loves you. And because he loves you, it's the same love. You know what? I have a child. When my child comes into my life, and when a child comes into somebody's life, you realize how selfish you were before, right? All of a sudden, you're willing to say, I won't eat so they can eat. I'll hurt so they can't hurt. I'll do something I don't have to do for another person. Why? Because it's a real love. That should happen in marriage. It should happen in children. That's the way it should happen. But that same love is the love that God has for you. If you really love him, then you should be willing to do something you don't have to do. And I'm not talking about getting you to sign up to serve somewhere. Of course, that's part of it. But being able to pray when you don't feel like praying. Being able to be faithful when you don't feel like being faithful. Being able to witness when you don't feel like witnessing. Being able to praise him when all around you seems like there's nothing to praise him about. Being able to forgive somebody when they've done you wrong. Even though you don't have to forgive them, you got a good reason. Listen, if you start extending that grace, guess what God's going to pour on your life? Grace. Because the principle is, tell me somebody.
If you've never received that first gift of God's grace, he loves you. If you can reach out to him today and step out of that place of being timid and say, God, I believe Jesus died on the cross for me. My only way to get to you is to be able to accept him as my savior. God, I'm a sinner. I don't come to you earning or deserving anything. You know who I am. Please forgive me. I believe you can. If you come to him today and you extend that, God will say, grace. I'll forgive your sins, son. I'll forgive your sins, daughter. You come into my family. You will be my child. I'll call you my child. And from that point on, he'll give you an opportunity to go out and represent him by showing what? The biggest thing that happened, I had an epiphany. I call it an epiphany. I'm sitting up in the office and there's a lot of times I'll sit there and read the word and write down this and write down this and then sometimes I find myself in a good 20, 30 minute days thinking, going to this place. And I found myself guilty of something. One of my favorite songs is Amazing Grace and anytime we talk about God's grace, As a Christian, even at my age now, I will tell you, I have not put as much emphasis on my grace as I have God's grace. I've praised him for it, praised him for it, but I asked myself a question the other day that humbled me, and I wept before God and fell on my knees and asked him to forgive me. I asked myself, hey, has my grace been amazing? Nobody could ever sing amazing grace to me. We expect to sing it to God, but is your grace amazing? If your grace was amazing, you would really be able to sing amazing grace because God gives grace for grace. If you're in here today and you've never accepted the Lord as your Savior, I plead to you, don't leave here today without giving him an opportunity to come into your life and give you that greatest gift of grace. I'll be standing up here. If you don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt, there's been a time in your life when you've accepted the Lord, not known that there's a God, not believe that Jesus died, but you've made it yours. Because either one of those things don't get you to God. That's just knowledge. You have to have heart knowledge. You have to ask him to use it. If you've not done that today, please come. I want to pray with you. You can give your heart to the Lord today. You can be saved. You can leave here as a child of God, knowing that you don't deserve it, but God loves you and he'll save you. And if you've done that today, respond to what he's told you this morning. If you haven't been one that's been willing to show grace, you look at what somebody's done, you harbor it and you keep it, but you've not given that grace. Listen, don't you worry about who's watching you. Get on your knees today and admit to God, confess to God, God, I haven't shown enough grace. I've expected it from you. I haven't shown enough grace. Forgive me and strengthen me in this area. And he tells you that's a prayer he wants to hear. And if you're somebody that wants to just show more grace, which all of us should, come ask him for that help. Everybody's got a reason to pray today. Stand with me, please. Lord, I love you and I praise you and I thank you for this day. I thank you, God, for how good you are to us all the time. I thank you, Lord, for your mercy and most of all, your grace. Thank you for just being able to show us your love through your grace, Lord. I pray, God, that you'd give us an opportunity right now to look at ourselves. If there's someone in this room that has never accepted your son, Jesus, Lord, let them see how willing you are to extend this offer of salvation, which is your grace on display. And Lord, if there are Christians in this room, and Lord, we've seen today, and Lord, we find ourselves lacking in here, God, I pray that you would just give the boldness for them to come and make it right with you. Lord, for those that are in here today that realize how true this is and they're seeing the works of grace, Lord, I pray you give them the boldness to fall before you and pray and give thanks today for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing page 634. 634.
He's talking about that spirit this morning. Amen. Do you feel it? Isn't it great when he speaks clear to us? Man, I love him. I appreciate you guys being in here and being so faithful this morning. I hope you felt his presence. I hope you heard his voice. And I hope that you find grace in his eyes. Amen. You will if you show grace. So I appreciate his word today, how true it always is. I invite you back this evening for everything that's going on. Um, not going to go through the whole thing again, but uh, if you heard it the first time, you know where you need to be. And at 6 o'clock tonight, let's come worship together. Let's see what God did at our stay-at-home mission, you know, to be able to make these relationships. And I see these young men and women that w we got to learn who they are and their names. And, and, and whether it was a young man or woman from our church or, or a resident of the home to establish these relationships and us to love on each other. Guys, we need to be able to glorify God and continue this on. So come tonight. Let's praise God for it and lift up his name. All right? We, we have to go home. I'm sure, but, uh, but it feels good enough to stay. All right, any announcement? Maybe I've forgotten something or anything I was supposed to announce? Anybody? All right. Scott Leslie, would you dismiss us in prayer?